The Emperor Alexander had left Vilna three days previously to join his headquarters at Svetsiani. The narrative of the military events of the Russian campaign is not within the scope of this work. Conscientious historians have already fulfilled this task with impartiality. Memoirs which are still unpublished will relate all the occurrences which took place and make all the conduct of this fatal war better known. The majority of writers who have undertaken to relate them have not justified their mission with sufficient impartiality. One animated with hostile sentiments against the fallen imperial government has, in his narrative, shown all the ardor of his hatred and all the injustice of his prejudices. Another devoted to the Bourbon government has tried to offer them a sacrifice of the great victim. A third, seeing in the events of this war the subject of a somber epic, which tempted his literary ambition, has strained his dreamy imagination to compose a drama, which by the manner of its exposure, its action, and its denouement, should realize the object which he had proposed to himself to attain. Although the causes and the combinations of this memorable expedition were in part unknown to him, the author has known how to suit them to the object he had in view. Agri Somnia. His melancholy genius took pleasure in painting in the blackest colors, misfortune which were cruel enough to need no exaggeration, and to excite the minds of men already struck with this immense catastrophe, whose deep emotions of which the human heart is so greedy. The mission of the Russian General Balakov at Vilna, the object of which is hardly known, was a preliminary of this fatal war and was perhaps its most certain precursor. The Emperor of Russia had received Count Nervon at Vilna in a manner which dispelled all hopes for the prevention of peace. He had moreover refused to see Count Loriston, our ambassador, and even to allow his prime minister to confer with him. War had already begun. Napoleon was already in the center of Lithuania. All communications seemed broken off between the two states when the arrival of a Russian officer at the imperial headquarters excited general surprise and brought back a ray of hope. This general officer, minister of police, whose mission no doubt was purely one of observation, bore an autograph letter from the emperor of Russia to Napoleon. In this letter, Alexander complained of the violation of his frontiers, declaring that Prince Kurikin had not been authorized to ask for the return of his credentials, and that if this was the reason why the emperor had considered himself at war with him, it was a great misunderstanding that if Napoleon was content to withdraw his troops from Russian territory, he was prepared to shut his eyes to what had happened, and that an arrangement was still possible. The emperor, comparing this step taken by Russia with the insistence with which Prince Kurikin had demanded his passports in Paris, with Alexander's refusal to listen to our ambassador and the cold reception which he had awarded to Count Nurban at Vilna, was greatly surprised at this so tardy a communication. He, however, asked the Russian envoy if he had powers and offered to treat for peace then and there. General Balakov had neither instructions nor powers. His mission was limited to renewing the injunction which had been made in Paris by Prince Kurikin and to demand the evacuation of the territories. The emperor concealing the resentment which he felt on the receipt of a notification which he was unable to define, received the bearer thereof very well, spoke to him of his master in a friendly way and with interest but could not but consider Alexander's message as a message intended to humiliate him, the effect of which had been well calculated by those who had advised it. Another incident which marked Napoleon's stay at Vilna was the reception of a deputation from the Diet of Warsaw, which came to ask him to declare himself in favor of a reestablishment of Poland. The address in which this wish was expressed, which had been written by the Abbe de Prat, who had not found the address written by the deputation sufficiently academical, was of a kind to embarrass the emperor. If he did not pronounce the decision which the Poles asked for, namely, the kingdom of Poland is reestablished, it was because he could not 
and would not guarantee anything at the beginning of a war, the chances of which could not be foreseen. Nor was he prepared to bind himself to the promise that he would not lay down arms until after the accomplishment of an engagement on this head. He wished indeed, in case of a want of success, to be able to conclude peace and not to prolong a struggle which, whilst exhausting the forces and the resources of France, would bring with it no decisive result for Poland. A fortunate war, followed by peace, could alone allow him to enfranchise this nation and to proclaim its independence. All, therefore, had to depend on the issue of this war and on the way in which the Poles should conduct themselves during its course. Such was the emperor's way of thinking. It has been seen that in the alliance which was concluded with Austria before the campaign was entered upon the cession of a part of Galicia had been stipulated for in case Poland should come to be reestablished as a consequence of the war. That is to say, after the conclusion of peace, when in 1806 Prussian Poland was created by the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, Napoleon had acted with the same circumspection and had refused to pronounce himself until after victory was his. The reasons which dictated the emperor's answer to the Poles were just and sincere. A prudent reserve dictated the language in which he spoke to them, although his mind was fully made up, to make the reestablishment of the Polish monarchy one of the conditions of peace, if victory once more remained faithful to the French flag. However, this declaration produced a bad effect on the Poles and even in France. Napoleon has been blamed for having been too prudent in this matter. On reading over his declaration attentively, it will, however, be found that he promised his support to the Polish nation in no ambiguous terms. If he did not add to the number of Russo-Polish provinces which he advised to revolt, the provinces which belonged to Austria, it was because the war being exclusively directed against Russia, it was to the Russo-Polish provinces alone that his cult to arms had exclusively to be addressed. Napoleon had moreover no wish to reveal the secret of his plans nor to alienate Austria, to whom he was bound by a treaty, by a want of consideration at the very outset of the campaign. What moral force would have remained to him if, in the course of a solemn audience, he had offended, by the use of indiscreet expressions, a power whose troops with the Prussian contingent formed the wings of his army? If the war had been crowned with success, the Austro-Polish provinces would necessarily have been returned to the reconstituted monarchy of Poland, Austria being compensated by means of an indemnity, which would have been equivalent and even superior. To appreciate Napoleon's interest in the reestablishment of Poland, it is necessary to make known the instructions which he had given to his ambassador at Warsaw. And above all, it is necessary to know why he had chosen him, with a view of assuring to his representative preponderant authority, for it was his to exercise a veritable vice royalty in Poland. The emperor had chosen him from amongst the high dignitaries of the church. The rank of archbishop gave to the French envoy a political character which gave him an exceptional position, an advantage which neither a general nor a civil functionary would have enjoyed in presence of the Polish generals and ministers. Only his choice of the man was a most unfortunate one. It is one of the few reproaches of the kind which can be addressed to Napoleon, who, as a rule, was so well able to find men fitted for the functions with which he intended to entrust them. The resume of the instructions given to Monsieur de Pratt was to see all, to know all, to direct all, to animate all, but he was not to let his hand be seen. What the emperor could not or did not wish to say was to be done by the country through the ambassador's influence. The latter was ordered to obtain from the Polish nation the revival of the great confederations, a pronouncement of its wishes, a vigorous display of all its forces, and a general revolt against Russia. The ambassador did Exactly the contrary. He made it his task to calm all agitation, to annihilate all manifestation, to cool all enthusiasm. He was ordered to keep the Diet constantly assembled, to inspire it, to keep up the warmth of its patriotic feelings, 
and the excitement with which its members were animated, and finally to keep it permanently in session so that there should always be a tribune from which the voices of those authorized to speak could address the country, inflame the minds of men, and keep the holy flame aglow. Monsieur de Prat dismissed this assembly after three days sitting. He sent the deputies back to their homes and retained alone a committee which he only assembled on rare occasions and which he prevented from acting in any way. A manifesto comprising addresses by Polish ministers of approved talent and patriotism whose voices were known to the Polish people had been written. The ambassador rewrote these according to his own way of thinking, considering that they were written in savage style and thus stripped these of their national character. In the same way, he disfigured the very pronouncement of the Confederation. The emperor hearing at Vilna of conduct so opposed to the orders he had given and so utterly inconsistent, regretted his choice and thought of recalling Mr. de Prat. But fearing that such a recall under existing circumstances might produce a bad effect, contented himself with sending him a severe reprimand and renewing his instructions in a positive and peremptory manner. The delirium of pride, however, blinded the archbishop. He woke up one day with the idea that the duchy was threatened by 60,000 Russians and at once thought of flight. He is urged to take advantage of the anxiety caused by this rumor to excite the Poles, to urge them on to levy troops, to organize guerillas, and to influence the numbers of agents of the insurrection. On the morrow, this imaginary danger having passed away, Monsieur de Prat considers these measures useless and falls back again into a state of apathy. There can be no doubt that the cooperation of the Poles would have been unanimous if the emperor's instructions could have been faithfully carried out, but the man who represented France at Warsaw seemed to make it his duty to paralyze their efforts. When one considers how Monsieur de Prat behaved in his embassy as proved by his own dispatches, by the emperor's instructions and the correspondence of the Ministry of Exterior Relations, one is tempted to accuse this fatal person of treachery, but the frivolity and the inconsistence of his character excludes such an idea. One cannot admit the suspicion that he had conceived two years in advance the plan of working in an underhand way towards the overthrow of the empire. All the evil he occasioned in the course of the mission to Warsaw with which Napoleon had entrusted him was inspired to him by his overweening arrogance and his foolish and ridiculous vanity. It remained only for the man who had basely flattered Napoleon in the days of his power, who had caused him such serious damage by his incapable conduct in Poland, to hurl calumny and insult in the face of the august and unhappy man. Nor did he fail to do so, acting like a faithless servant, as soon as having nothing more to expect from his ancient benefactor and master, he had at the same time no more reason to fear him. The history of the embassy to Warsaw is a monument of ingratitude and cowardice to which history ought to do justice had it ever occasion to deal with its author. A provisional government was established at Vilna. It was composed of seven members belonging to the most important families in Lithuania. Here are their names. Count Sultan, Prince Alexander Sipiha, Count Pataki, Count Sierkovsky, Count Prozar, Count Tissenhaus, and the president of the University of Vilna, Mr. Sniadeki, a guard of honor under the command of Count Oginsky, was placed at the emperor's service, followed him to Moscow, and accompanied him on his treat retreat as far as Vilna. This guard of honor, which was small in number, but whose zeal never slackened for an instant, formed the nucleus of the second regiment of light Polish cavalry of the guard. Many leading Poles, prompted by patriotic feelings and animated by the hope of contributing in a more efficacious manner to the reestablishment of the Polish nation, followed the imperial headquarters as volunteers, sharing the vicissitudes of the dangers of the French army.